Hello, dear listeners. I am a big, big fan of today's guest, Malcolm Gladwell. If you're not familiar with Mr. Gladwell, he is the host of the incredible podcast, Revisionist History, as well as a staff writer for The New Yorker. And those aren't even the things he's really known for. Malcolm is the author of several very influential and insightful books, including The Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers, David and Goliath, and Talking to Strangers. I have to confess, I was a little nervous to talk with Malcolm, but he could not have been more fun or more fascinating. Later in the episode, I'm joined by social psychologist, marriage, and relationship expert Eli Finkel with some qualified advice for our listeners. Lastly, I want to thank you again for all the kind reviews and comments. It truly makes me so happy to hear from you. To get in touch with us, please look for the link at unqualified.com. I really want to talk with you. Okay. Are you ready? Here's Malcolm. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Hey, good morning. Hi, Anna. How are you? Hi, great. How are you, Malcolm? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Not at all. I thought it'd be fun. I hope so. I hope it's fun. So, Malcolm, first of all, where are you? Do you mind my asking? I'm in upstate New York, Hudson Valley. You write, so you work pretty much in solitude. Have you learned anything about yourself during quarantine? <laughs> my life has not been that much different than it was before because... I was living up here largely most of the time anyway, and my routine is pretty much the same as it was. I don't travel as much. It's really the only difference in my life. And we've been relatively unaffected up here, so life's been pretty normal. Malcolm, I meant to start this interview out by complimenting you. You can start. All right. I will. I will. (laughs) Well, I'm a huge fan of yours. I'm a huge fan of the subject of curiosity in general. And I love your podcast. I think I picked up Tipping Point years ago at an airport, and it comforted me in a way I think that was unexpected, Mm -hmm. and which I think a lot of your work does, which maybe goes back to what I've learned a little bit about myself, which is embarrassing during quarantine. I was very dismissive of puzzlers before quarantine. I thought puzzling was an idiotic waste of time. You're putting pieces of cardboard together. I've completed maybe 36 puzzles. Oh, wow. Yeah. You've gone puzzle nuts. I comfort myself because it does feel like a complete waste of time that frustrates some of the people that I love. They're like, what What are you doing wasting your time with all this? But I like to think my justification is that I'm trying to make order out of a chaos. Mm -hmm. And that's a very simplistic way to sort of frame what you do. But I love how you connect two seemingly obscure random ideas and find patterns within them. Would you describe that as kind of an accurate assessment of, Malcolm, can you put these in your own words? I'm simply an actor. People give me words, usually. You know, I had one of my first acting experience a couple weeks ago. You did? I did a TV commercial with Kevin Hart, which was, first of all, I will answer your question, but I wanted to go into this whole side. So I didn't know anything about acting. And if you don't know anything about acting, you think it's easy. And then I was like, oh my God, it's really hard. <laughs> and I realized I'm not even, I was like 2% towards understanding how hard it was. Like I got a little tiny glimpse of, because I was across this table from Kevin Hart, you know, we're in a shot together and he would do his bit and I would do my bit. And I was like, Good Lord, like in a million years, I cannot, what he's doing is magical. And he could transform himself. And I was like, I've never felt like such an idiot in my life. So I was just countering your little bit of (laughs) self-deprecation. When you say I'm just an actor, people give me words. Well, come on. Thanks, Malcolm. (laughs) But wait, do you remember your lines from your ad? No, of course not. Of course not. No, by the way, Kevin Hart, he's like, Let me leave you on a secret. I don't read the script. He said, I look at it and I memorize it. And he literally took the script, looked at a page for like five seconds, turned it, five seconds, turned it, five seconds, and then he knew it all. That blew me away. I think that there is like, you know, when um, like being on a television show for seven years, it was pretty remarkable how my brain would get trained. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
it happened a little less <laughs> less rapidly than I would have liked, but I was towards like, you know, after you do a show for five years, you are able to, maybe there's something that becomes lyrically patterned mm-hmm. in your brain, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And then you have to get over the idea of just that fear. I used to audition, but my neck used to shake so badly. And I was told like by casting directors, please don't be so nervous. You're good. And I couldn't get over this feeling of my neck. Like they're going to notice my whole head is just trembling. Not even in conjunction with my spine. It's just like this shaking head. And I think that I had to like mentally try to play a character within a character, a character who was not nervous, who was auditioning. (laughs) (laughs) That's like, yeah, some very meta kind of... uh... But Malcolm, I just wouldn't have pegged you as somebody who underestimates anything. Well, you always... Everyone does that, though. Like, this is the great problem that empathy wrestles with. And that is that when you look at someone from the outside, what you don't know is always greater than what you know. You have no idea what it feels like to be a doctor unless you actually put yourself in the shoes of a doctor, right? Like deliberately, carefully, considerately put yourself in that person's shoes. And I can name that for every single thing that people do. The only reason I know anything about what it means to be a teacher is that my brother was a teacher. Now he's a principal. And I have listened to him over the years, talk about that profession and what it takes. You know, I used to be one of those people who would say, oh, teaching, you know, you get four months off a year. How hard is it? And I'm now the opposite. I'm now like, that is one of the hardest jobs known to man. They deserve a lot more money and a lot more respect. But, you know, absent that kind of experience, you don't have someone like my brother in your life. How do you learn about another person's business or profession or, you know, day-to-day life? It's, It's difficult. You have to experience it. I completely agree. And I think that that is how we progress as a society with larger degrees of empathy. Yeah. Malcolm, as I stare at your bookshelf behind you, do you have a book you're slightly embarrassed of? I have so many books. I know. I bet. I bet you do. I divided them up. This is a very specific collection of books. Has it been curated for these specific moments? (laughs) You can be honest with me. I mean, this painting behind me has been curated for this moment. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no curation. I do different kinds of work in different kinds of places. So I've just written this long audiobook, which we're going to be recording, and it's all about World War II and the Air Force in World War II. And so it's a, um, a longer version of the thing I did for my podcast episodes on this year. So a lot of the books behind are books about bombing. There's maybe 50 books about bombing behind me. Does the book mostly focus on the Pacific theater? Yes. Hey. I know. Very nice use of military <laughs> lingo. I'm impressed. <laughs> Wait, you're not an Air Force brat, are you? No, no. But my parents used to drag me to lectures at the mm. University of Washington by this great history professor who would cover a war every semester, a different war. And he was just a fabulous. Anyway, I think my parents enjoy history a lot. Yeah. But Malcolm, wait, can we get back to your guilty pleasures, like television-wise or movie-wise or book-wise? Guilty pleasures. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, what are they? Well, I mean, I just finished uh, Emily in Paris. Thought it was fantastic. I don't think that qualifies. Like, if you said keeping up with the Kardashians, that would qualify Mr. Gladwell. (laughs) (laughs) there is an awful lot of snobbery towards emily and paris out there let me just say this oh really okay in the day nobody was a bigger melrose place fan than i was in fact i used to so this is before blogs and something i used to send out every week after the melrose place episode i would send out this long email which was a, a kind of comic summary of Melrose Place. And it would get copied and resent. And I'm pretty sure that by the end, the writers on the show were reading it. Oh, I bet. I used to devote hours to this. I would spend the entire morning after the show crafting this like thousand word synopsis of what had happened the previous day on Melrose Place. Malcolm, we have to see these sometime. I can't find them. I, I looked for them once. I had a kind of grand theory of Melrose Place, which was 90210 is a show about teenagers who behave like adults. That's why it was interesting. Because it was like, you think you're watching a show about high school. It's not about high school. Merrill's Place was the opposite. It was adults behaving like teenagers. And that was the trick. So these shows which got lumped together were actually polar opposites. And so understanding Merrill's Place was all about understanding just how dumb 
could a functioning adult be and like survive in the world of mental space? Like mental space had doctors. Like I remember, but yeah, Kimberly was a doctor, Dr. Kimberly. Am I right, Dr. Kimberly Burns? I'm forgetting. Anyway, it's been so long. I got to know what she's a doctor of. Exactly. It was never clear. They were like, one minute they're a surgeon, one minute they're a therapist, one minute they're like, it just would shift from week to week. It was a hilarious, the kind of core of that show was so deeply hilarious and kind of brilliant. Anyway, I was addicted. My point is, I've been addicted to this kind of stuff for a long time. And I quite enjoyed Emily in Paris. Has there been like another series that has hit you in the same way that Melrose Place did? Or was that just the perfect time in your life? Well, recently in pandemic, I watched on Netflix, um, Black AF, which I thought was really, really good. Like first class. I haven't seen that. It took like three episodes for me to understand how good it was because they were doing something really, really interesting, I thought, which was subverting that kind of TV show in this really kind of clever way and putting upper middle class black people in a position you never see them in television. And then, of course, it was insanely funny. And that's one of the better bits of TV I've watched in quite some time. Lately, I've just been watching a lot of news and reality TV. Yeah. Hey, Malcolm, speaking a little bit about news and stuff, a question that I did want to ask you. If you could pull the thread of somebody in the current administration, is there a character that intrigues you more than others in the Trump landscape? If I could sit down and interview, you know, at length, anyone after this is over, it would be Ivanka. Oh, really? Okay. You know, her husband strikes me as a bit of a dud. I mean, she's clearly the smart one. I feel like deep down in her heart, she knows better, but she's in an impossible situation. This is her father. To make a break with a family member is one of the hardest things a human being can do. And she threw in her lot with her dad before this happened. So that made it even harder. She signed on for Team Trump and she's the apple of her father's eye. And then she must have had some inkling as she got older about, you know, what kind of person he really was. But we're never more blind than when we're looking at our parents, particularly when we have a strong bond with them. And the whole psychology of someone who throws in their lot with their father and then over the course of their adult life, their father is revealed to be more and more of a monster and it, it becomes too late to jump ship. That's one reading of her psychology. Um, I find that incredibly fascinating. I would make, I guess, the case that it's not too late. I'm a little bit fascinated by William Barr at this point. Oh, God, yeah. He doesn't seem like philosophically a likely pawn, but perhaps. So it feels like there's definitely a deeper mystery there. Anyway, maybe you can solve it, Malcolm. He's one of a number. Pompeo is the same way. These are people who had very kind of shiny establishment credentials and were respected by people in the kind of quote unquote establishment. Everyone thought that when Barr went to work for the Trump White House, he was going to be the voice of reason. Same thing with Pompeo. And then these guys, they get there and then they turn into something unexpected. That's also super fascinating. It's like there's this force field around Trump and you get drawn into it and suddenly you're a different person. That's also super interesting. He does have this kind of weird, dark charisma. I mean, no one gets drawn into the Mike Pence force field, right? You, you know. But it happens with Trump. These guys just kind of like lose their marbles when they step in a room with him. I thought Michael Cohen spoke about that seduction of the celebrity, of the glamour, of the ladies, the parties, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I don't see bars being seduced by that necessarily. But who knows? Malcolm, I still want to get like to an embarrassing book. You must have them somewhere. Oh, embarrassing book. Well, my point was they were in a different bookcase. I can reference them. Well, I want to hear like, do you have like Sweet Valley High? Hold on, let me look in this book. Yes. But you're familiar with Sweet Valley High? No. I have tons and tons and tons and tons of um, airport thrillers. Are you fascinated by aviation in and of itself or aviation in combination with weaponry? In and of itself, because it's something that I didn't know anything about until in doing this season's revisionist history, I was telling the story about the bombing of Japan. And I had known a little bit about the Air Force and about World War II before, but not a lot. I went through this kind of crash course and started hanging out with all these Air Force people and just found myself hooked. So it's a pretty new fascination. I've always loved planes. 
But the idea of like bombers and fighters is a kind of new thing. I wasn't one of those kids who was playing endless war games as a child. But um, I actually sort of fell in love with the Air Force for a whole number of reasons. And I was sort of thinking about this recently, and I think it's because, particularly now, the idea that there would be in American society an incredibly well-functioning meritocracy is a kind of weird and novel one. It's the institution, like the last two secretaries of the Air Force have both been women. The current chief of staff of the Air Force is an African-American. The head of the Air Force Academy is an African-American. I could keep going. If you look at the leadership structure of the Air Force, you will see more diversity than any other major American institution. I think you're getting to the idea of like what set that precedent. I think it's because they were real meritocracy. Well, there's two things I will say. One is that the military is further along than I think many other institutions in society in getting rid of the kind of biases and barriers that lead you to overlook talent. They really think if you're good, we want you. And then whether you're a man or a woman or whether you're black or white or whatever is a secondary consideration. That's part of it. And two, because they've had that historic role that they have, you know, ever since the Second World War, they had to confront race in the Second World War a generation before other institutions did. And a third thing, and I've learned this more recently, and I've had conversations with people high up in the Air Force, their level of kind of sensitivity over this issue is really high. They really, really genuinely want to do better when it comes to increasing the diversity of the Air Force. It's really high up on their list of things they care about. They're not doing it because it looks good, because no one's paying attention, right? It's not like they're printing for the cameras. There's no cameras on this. And I just found that in 2020, I found that so amazing and refreshing. Yeah. This episode is brought to you in part by Plant Botanical. As everyone slowly comes out of hiding, Many of you are asking the same questions. Am I ready for actual human contact? Should I swipe right? Will they look like their picture? Do I look like my picture? Is that the face of an ax murderer? Do I really wanna take off these sweats? And for those of you who get that far, what drink should I be casually sipping? I have the answer to that one. While your date sits awkwardly silent, stunned by your good looks, dazzled by your intellect, or wondering how to dispose of your body, the drink in your hand should be delicious, refreshing, crisp, clean, plant botanical vodka seltzer. Weighing in at only one carb, made with real fruit and botanicals traditionally used for stamina, immunity, and detox, Plant Botanical is already thinking about your future encounters. Follow and DM at Plant Loves You and share a story or video of your funniest, wildest, or most awkward date for a chance to win up to $1,000 for your next one. Plant Botanical, your perfect companion while you look for your perfect companion. Available at Target, Pavilions, Vons, Total Wine, or visit plantlovesyou.com to find a store near you. Plant Vodka and Vodka Seltzer, just the good shit. I don't know when the Air Force was established, Officially established in 1947, I believe. And I yeah. wonder if in a progressive post-war environment, if that kind of set the tone for yeah. being a more progressive institution in terms of how we think about. I think that's absolutely, it was very much when they were starting the Air Force, that we're starting from scratch. We're building a modern military organization and we're going to put, you know, all of this history behind us. That was very much a part of their ethos at the beginning. There's a lot of snobbery but towards both snobbery and contempt towards government institutions in our society, I think. What I really got from this, my immersion in this, is that there are profoundly important examples of how to do things right that come from government. And I don't know why in America we've decided that government is just kind of backwater, because I think the opposite is true in many respects. I want to believe, Malcolm, what you believe. And I do think it's interesting, like the implementation of like Donald Duck as part of getting people to pay a federal tax. Mm -hmm. Or like something like Smokey the Bear, preventing forest mm -hmm. fires. Mm -hmm. And if we had a similar government idea around that built a sense of community, something with our current situation with COVID, like I wonder how, I guess the idea of government propaganda can be very useful. Mm -hmm. But Malcolm, I'm getting into territory that I don't know anything about. Can we get back to bombs? Sure. <laughs> Can you tell us like three things that really surprised you about what you've learned about bombing during World War II? Mm -hmm. So here's one thing. Maybe the most important thing is, so I did this 
four episodes of my podcast, Revisions History, this season on a guy named Curtis LeMay, this famous Air Force general during the Second World War, and about this decision he makes to bomb Japan, Tokyo, and other cities uh, at the end of the Second World War. And a lot of the show is quite critical of the conduct of this general and the Air Force in the Second World War. And I was expecting that people who are in the Air Force would be defensive or critical or react negatively to my show. The opposite is the case. What I discovered was that in these kinds of institutions, the capacity for self-criticism and the willingness to go back and say, you know what, we screwed up there, or I wouldn't do that today, or we learned, that surprised me. I thought if I criticized their institution, they would their back would get up and didn't get up at all. They got really curious. And then I discovered, you know, I was just in at Maxwell Air Force Base a couple of months ago talking to some historians and you will find the greatest amount of criticism and self-reflection on the Air Force can be found within the Air Force. That is a really, really lovely trait. And if other institutions, again, I keep coming back to what can we learn from institutions like the Air Force, but that idea of like, if you internalize your self-criticism, you don't have an antagonistic attitude towards your critics, they hire their critics, <laughs> like they employ them. I mean, I love that notion. I'm reminded, this is a tangent, but the first person we hired at my little audio company that I started with my friend Jacob was a woman named Mia LaBelle. And Mia came, we interviewed her for the job of producer of my podcast. And we gave her a list of all the topics that I wanted to do my first season on. And she looked at the list in the job interview and she said, if you do these shows, no woman in America is going to listen to your show. She was basically dissing us. She was like, she's a bunch of middle-aged guys. And she thought she was ruining her chances of getting the job. She's like, that's it. I've, I've just dissed them. They're going to go for someone else. And I was a little taken aback. But then I realized, no, 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 this is exactly the person I need to hire. And it's that same impulse. Like, I want my critic working for me. How much better off are we going to be in the long run? And she, Mia turns out to be this unbelievably smart, honest. She says exactly what's on her mind. She has incredible taste. She works really, I mean, she has made what we do twice as good. And it was all about us accepting the fact that you want that person. You know, if we'd gotten defensive, we'd be half as good as we are today. Malcolm, not to embarrass you as we're Zooming together here today, but part of your genius is that you weave a story. You make anything that you're interested in very, very interesting. And that is a wonderful quality. In terms of the threads that you want to pull or the stories, I'm sure you must have a handful of stories that you pursued that have either been incredibly frustrating or haven't led to the conclusion that you've anticipated? Have you abandoned stories many times or at all? Sure. But usually it's because it's not that I like it when it goes in directions I hadn't anticipated. That's not a reason to abandon. That's not a reason to get even more invested. Usually it's because I don't know I can't figure out how to tell the story or what the story is. I just know this is a really, really dumb, obvious distinction, but the difference between a good topic and a good story. And a lot of people who aren't storytellers, they'll give you a topic and they'll say, you should really do a show on, you know, Little League parents. And there may be tons of interesting stories about (laughs) hyper-controlling parents, but what you've given me is not a story. What you've given me is a topic. So you start with topics and you find stories And I start with a lot of topics and don't manage to find the story. And now that I do podcasts mostly, the story is different in a podcast than it is in a book. How do you mean? Because podcasts are so emotional and there's so much more about feeling and about character and about, this is from my friend uh, Charles Randolph who always says, we think with our eyes and we feel with our ears. So podcast is, I'm inside your ears. I have a pipeline to your heart. You know, it's really hard to make someone cry on the page. Really easy to make someone cry comparatively if you're talking to them. So it just means that there are stories you can't tell on a podcast. Like if they have lots of numbers or big complicated ideas, that's for writing. But a story where I'm trying to convince you to love someone or to understand someone or to believe in someone, those are stories you could tell in audio. And those are the stories I want to tell now. So it was worked out well for me, but it's different. I love that. I started my podcast over six years ago now, and it was a reaction to my day job. <laughs> it, to me, it felt like an avenue of connection. In an idealistic version, I guess, would be that like four strangers would listen. 
and I would be able to have contact with them have mm-hmm. conversations with people having a completely different life experience. There was this thing called chat roulette. Do you remember chat roulette at all? Oh my God, vaguely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt like the grandest international social experiment and I loved it so much. You could log on just chatroulette.com and you would find yourself anywhere in the world with somebody you had no idea where you were going and then you mm-hmm. could immediately next them if you didn't care for the conversation. There weren't rules. You didn't know who these people were. They didn't know who you were. And you had the opportunity to opt out of the conversation whenever you wanted to and flip to somebody else. I was intrigued by the idea of what does communication look like when the stakes are extreme? Like they're high in one sense, because if you're having an interesting conversation, they're gone and incredibly low because you're not putting yourself out there in any kind of salesmanship form. And then it became just masturbators, like quickly. (laughs) And then it got shut down. But I really loved the idea. It felt to me like internet at its best Mm -hmm. when it was at its best. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I had a long conversation with a librarian in Texas. I had like a fun night with some dudes in the Ukraine. I felt like I went to Brazil a few times. It was a fabulous social experiment that quickly, quickly got corroded. Yeah. But anyway, I still hope for more of that kind of thing. So that's why I started this podcast. And I do believe in the intimacy of it, though. It is kind of amazing. I mean, it's totally unexpected. I started out thinking it was the same kind of storytelling that I've been doing all along. But the kind of connection you get I'm mildly recognizable. So from time to time, somebody comes up to me and says, hey, I read one of your books. And what I've noticed is there's a different way that people come up to you if they've listened to your podcast than it is if they've read one of your books. They use the word fan a lot more. Hey, I'm a fan of your podcast. Whereas they'll say, I really liked your book, which is a different, you know, if you think about it, quite a different reaction. What they're saying is I like you. Whereas before they said, I like that thing you did. Very personal. And the other thing is, it's always Malcolm, and they are reacting to me not as they would to a real celebrity. They're reacting to me as if I was a friend of theirs, right? Super interesting. And I much prefer this. I've never wanted to be a celebrity. I think that's like you're inside that cage. It's horrible. People's reactions are so weird. Your life is not normal. My life's totally normal. These people who come up to me, They're not like, you know, fanning out and doing, jumping up and down. They're like, hey, Malcolm, fan of the show. Keep walking, right? (laughs) You know, like, it's so interesting. That's not a reaction I would have anticipated. Completely. I love it that when I have podcast fans, it's a completely different interaction. Mm -hmm. Usually it feels, like you said, intimate. People won't ask me for a picture or anything like that. Or it feels wonderful. Yeah. It's a different kind of intimacy. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Gladwell, what talent or ability would you most like to have? To compose and perform music. Would you like to be a singer? Well, I'd been doing this project with Paul Simon, where I spent hours and hours and hours with him, and we're turning it into an audio documentary. And as you know, he's a genius. And having spent so much time with him, I feel like I understand, it was like goes back to what we were talking about at the top, I now understand a little bit more about this world than I used to. And I'm more amazed than ever about the incredible power that music can have. Like, I don't think anything I do ever has the kind of immediate emotional effect on people that a really wonderful song does. And when I listened to him describe what he did, my sense was I could never in a million years do that. It's like he has this gift that I don't even vaguely understand. It just seems like it comes from another planet. I'm just in awe of it. I mean, completely. And just that idea of like standing up on a stage and playing a guitar and singing a song and having 20,000 people be in rapt attention as you do that. Doesn't that seem like weird and fantastic, like crazy? Completely. But Malcolm, do you have enough time or ambition to conquer this in your life? No, I don't. I, it's not going to happen. It's a concession. It's not happening. I think to be good at music, you need to have some innate musical ability, you know, and then on top of that, you need to spend an extraordinary amount of time developing that ability. I have neither the innate ability nor the time, so it's not in the cards, which is fine, you know, but you asked me, hypothetically, if we could do this over, I would want this. No, I don't know anything about football, but I was reading about this. I don't even know who he is, but who has developed a strategy for something called the stiff arm. Oh, yeah. The picture just looks like it's a push away, like just holding out your arm in a stiff position. 
but apparently he has three different brilliant strategies for deflection. Derek Henry is his name. Yeah, see, Malcolm, you already know this stuff. Well, but I love the idea that there is a specific ability that's seemingly easy, I guess, but of course requires so much brilliance. Okay, wait. For what historical figure would you start a fan club? Well, you know, it would be someone, I'm going to give you the vague answer. You know, my mom is Jamaican and it always amazes me because I have that connection and I grew up in Canada. So if you're in America, you're always struck by how little Americans know about any small country anywhere. <laughs> any big country anywhere. <laughs> so I feel like I come from two neglected countries. And I thought it would be fun. Jamaica is, it does punch above its weight. I mean, it, for Italians, it's a little country, it's given a lot to the world. My grandfather was a politician in Jamaica in a very tumultuous period in Jamaican politics, where politics was full of these characters, like these larger than life. There's a guy named Bustamante. First of all, just such a wonderful name, who was this kind of semi-literate, insanely charismatic, and my grandfather knew him. And I mean, someone like that who played a really crucial part in Jamaican independence and in sort of the formation of the modern Jamaican state. Someone like that who we've never heard of, you know, nothing about his, about the politics, you know, very little about the country, just to kind of remind Americans that sophisticated political life exists outside of their borders and pick a place they would never. No one thinks about Jamaican politicians. They always think about Jamaican athletes or Jamaican singers, or I just think it would be useful to pick someone like that and just learn about. Buster Betty would be a great choice, actually. And he was a great looking guy. He had a big, huge kind of wild, what we would now call an Afro, which wasn't called an Afro back then. But um, I think that would be my choice. I love that. All right, Buster. Busta Mains? Busta, they used to call him Busta. I love it. I've written it down. Maybe we can start this fan club. <laughs> This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Intuit, powering products like TurboTax, QuickBooks, Mint, and Credit Karma. Intuit works for what you work for, and it was only recently that I found out they were working for me. I've been using QuickBooks for years and more recently began using Mint, which is an easy way to create monthly budgets. It was a bit surprising to realize how much I could save by learning how to make coffee. With Intuit, Artificial intelligence can predict your future cash flow, recognize a misplaced digit in an account or routing number, and even connect users with live experts who can assist with navigating life changes or help with unique tax situations. Everything is automatically organized as you track your personal or business expenses by scanning receipts, invoices, and other financial documents, while smart budgeting tools let you know before you overspend. Innovative features like these make managing your finances simple, but as you probably already knew, innovation is at the core of everything Intuit does. Discover how Intuit's products can help you see what's possible at Intuit.com. That's I-N-T-U-I-T dot com. All right, on what occasion do you lie? When do I lie? I don't lie a lot because invariably they come back to haunt you, but to the extent I do lie, I probably lie to protect my privacy. So my mom said this thing to me once, one of her child rearing techniques, which was, you should never ask your child a question if in answering it, your child is forced into a lie. Her idea was lying is a habit. The more your child does it, it'd be easy to do. So don't elicit a lie. If you know that they came in at 2 a.m. and their curfew was midnight, don't ask them, what time did you come in last night? right? They're going to lie. You're eliciting a lie. Don't do that. You know what the answer is. I thought that was really good advice. So I think along those same lines that a lot of people invite lies because they ask questions where the truth is either too difficult or the truth is none of their damn business, right? Completely. In those situations, I will lie. You ask me a question you shouldn't have asked. I'm going to lie because it's none of your damn business. Even if there's nothing at stake, I have sometimes done this as a matter of principle. Like you don't have the right to that answer. You have no standing to ask that question. I'm making myself sound very defensive. And no, no, Malcolm. I was just thinking, like, I need to sear this into my brain. So if a journalist ever asks, hey, well, you know, I follow Malcolm Gladwell's philosophy, and you have no fucking right to ask me that question. <laughs> All right. If you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would it be? Oh, wow. What a great question. I thought about that a lot recently. And I thought about it because theoretically, I could live anywhere. It's actually not an abstract question. Tel Aviv, Johannesburg. Why? I want to go somewhere 
far enough outside my own culture that I that I'm really learning something new, but not so far that I couldn't integrate myself into the society. Do you know what I mean? I would like to go someplace where I would be forced out of myself. So I was in Johannesburg recently, and I've been to Tel Aviv, and both times I've been struck by this thing that when you live in a country which has enormous challenges or threats or whatever, you live outside of yourself a lot. You have to, right? To engage at all with the act of being a citizen of that place, you have to think about things other than your own little parochial concerns. And I think we sometimes forget how liberating and inspiring that can be. You know, you mentioned Johannesburg people and they'll say, oh, incredible social problems, crime, a list of all the negatives, but they've forgotten the positives, which is you're in the middle of a grand experiment, right? You're trying to make a country from scratch and you're in your whatever it is now, 20 of that, that's really, really young. It's hard, but it's also kind of thrilling. And if you're in the middle of that experiment, you don't spend a lot of time worrying about some pathetic little problem in your own life. There's like stuff going on. Same thing in Tel Aviv. There's stuff going on, right? Like you're forced out of yourself. Particularly if I was younger, if I was a kind of typical privileged, pampered 18-year-old American teenager, that's exactly where I would go. Like get out of your own head for a while. Wrestle with something real. And I could give five other places like, you don't want to go to a place that's chaos, but just somewhere where there's something to think about that's big. I love that. I think a lot of people in the entertainment industry living in Los Angeles, it can be thrilling with personal success and opportunity, but there isn't a sense of a larger community or idea or even a sense of community struggle in any way. It's all very individual. Mm -hmm. I've never been to a place that has a political strife or that much outside of my comfort zone, really. Mm -hmm. All right. What was your worst impulse purchase? <laughs> uh, so many. Makarna. And I bought for way too much money this vintage Mercedes. And the minute I got it, I realized I didn't want it. Now trying to get rid of it. I'm quite self-conscious about some of the things that I own. My parents are exceedingly modest people. And I'm financially successful in a way that I never anticipated and well beyond anything I grew up with. And I'm very, very conscious of the kind of uh, gap between the values I was raised to have and the kind of values I could potentially demonstrate to the world. I now, if I wanted to be like a total baller and live in a massive house in Thousand Oaks and drive a Lamborghini, I actually could. I don't want to, but you know, I could do that. And once you're in a realm of you could do all this stuff, you have to formulate the difference between can't and won't. Can't's really easy. It's really easy to say I would never drive a Lamborghini if you can't afford a Lamborghini. But once you can afford a Lamborghini, now you have to say I won't drive a Lamborghini. But Malcolm, I bet this Mercedes is gorgeous. <laughs> Do you least love to look at it? Like, no. Does it give you any joy? No. No, no joy. No, no joy. It's not a fancy Mercedes, by the way. It's just in very good condition. It's like a one of those old Mercedes sedans, you know, those from the early 70s. But I don't know. I just like look at it and I think that's just not actually what I want to be seen in. That's fair. All right. Um, Malcolm, what qualities do you look for in a friend? Well, I mean, the obvious ones would be loyalty and generosity. But uh, thinking about my friends and thinking about what they have in common, I guess they all have a kind of humility about them. I realized recently that two of my closest friends are the children of Baptist and evangelical ministers. They're preacher's kids, and they're not goody-goody teacher's kids, but they got the good part of being a preacher's kid, which was growing up in a place where, and I'm going back to the point I was making earlier, where you're not the center of your world. The wonderful thing about religion properly practiced to me is that it displaces you from the center of your universe, and it puts someone else much more important at the center. And that idea that your job is to serve something larger than you, not to arrange your life so everything circles around you, is, to my mind, absolutely central. And it's easier if you grew up in a religious household, that's just an easier thing to grasp if your whole kind of upbringing has been centered around God as opposed to around you, right? So I think that's probably why a lot of my friends, they're people who by one means or another have adopted that position on the world, that they are not at the center. I like that. Malcolm, I want to diverge for a second to your podcast, Revisionist History. In season five, uh -huh. 
you open your season, I think, is it the first two episodes or the second and third where you talk a lot about the art museum and Van Gogh? Oh, yeah. I think it's maybe it's first and second. Yeah. It's brilliant. And your curiosity about these massive art collections that are kept in storage at museums. Yeah. And you link it to the idea of hoarding. Mm -hmm. And I'm a bit of a hoarder. Probably in a different way. I don't have art collections. But I believe you're advocating for free access to museums, essentially. And instead of like the Met selling off some of their valuable pieces, Mm. will you talk a little bit about this idea and like the socioeconomic idea of art? Yeah. I got really intrigued by the fact that most major art museums in this country, 90 to 95% of their collection is in storage and you never see it, and they never show it. And they keep collecting stuff, and a lot of the stuff they collect goes straight into storage. So it begins to ask the question, well, what exactly are they doing? I understand that museums think they have a responsibility to be the kind of repository for art. You know, they collect art the way that libraries collect books or whatever, sure. But, like, if people are never going to see what you have, if you're this engine where you raise huge amounts of money in order to buy more art that no one ever sees... What's the point? You know, Hollywood doesn't make hundreds and thousands of films every year that immediately go into a place where no one sees them. You know what I mean? Like, it's unusual for an artistic endeavor to think of itself as being distinct from its audience and its obligations to its audience. There are many museums, Met, I use as an example, would rather raise admission fees than sell art if they run out of money, which struck me as totally insane. You'd rather erect a barrier to people to come and look at things than part with something that no one will ever see. Is there also an unspoken idea of like people will value an experience more if they have invested in it? For an out-of-towner to go to the Met is now, I think, 25 bucks. If you are a family of five, four, two kids and two parents, you come to New York, you're from some small town somewhere, that's a lot of money. For rich New Yorkers, like, oh, I'm gonna go by myself, I'm gonna do 20 bucks. A hundred bucks yeah. to show your kids, to introduce your kids to the world of art. So immediately all you're doing is you're saying, I don't want, if you're the man, you're saying, I no longer want that person. I'd rather tell that person with four kids coming in from out of town, you know, why don't you just go to the Lion King and get lunch at Friendly's or whatever and call it a day. And to my mind, that's like, sorry, that's bullshit. Yeah. You have a public obligation to show art to the world and to share in this extraordinary grid of genius that you're sitting on. And the other thing is, maybe it means that someone, if you have a big fee like that, maybe they go once to the Met instead of twice, or twice instead of four times. Why would you want to do that? Like, that's just bananas. Everything about that is just so offensive to me. And it fits in with something that's going on in our society, which is that wealthy institutions are hell-bent on getting even wealthier, even when they have nothing to spend that extra wealth on. Harvard University does not need another dime. What do they do? They go out and they vacuum up as much loose change as they can, leaving less money on the table for people who actually need it. It's a crazy thing we do in this society that I don't understand. Malcolm, I love to think that you could change things with the Met. Have you had any response? I mean, what a grand world it would be if your podcast shifted the entry fee. We got some response from the Met and it was just defensiveness and half puff. You know, to go back to what we were saying earlier, they're not inviting their critics in. Right. They're like saying, you have no idea of the blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I kind of do have an idea. Right. Yeah, it's not hard to figure out what you're doing. Malcolm, I love this battle, though. It's a perfect microcosm and a perfect example of how we are approaching things incorrectly. So thank you for doing that. Okay, wait, more questions, if you don't mind. What is your favorite rainy day movie? Mm, Probably Four Weddings at a Funeral. It's a great one. Because by the time you're like weeping uncontrollably and it's raining outside, you're wrapped up in a blanket. That's just about like, that's ideal. As far as I can yeah. Say. What is a trait you dislike in others? The normal one, selfishness, probably narcissism. What is a trait you dislike in yourself? Oh, there's a number. I wish I was less um, introverted. I think I retreat into myself a little too much. Yeah. I think I do too, because I don't think I'm great at small talk. Mm -hmm. somewhere where people were learning how to have banter. (laughs) I don't know where where I was. When or where are you happiest, Malcolm? Probably in the middle of a good book, when the best parts are still to come, but you're in deep enough that 
you know you're onto something lovely. What book did you read at like age 13 or 14 that shifted you? I was reading weirdly in those years about American politics. Do you remember what time period you were obsessed with? You know, like contemporary, like this was the 70s for me. So so like Nixon and Carter and stuff? Yeah, I was reading books about Richard Nixon when I was, when I was 13 or 14. There was a book by Gary Wills called Nixon Agonistes, which I remember reading at that age. I probably understood half of it, but it had a huge effect on me. All right. Is there a moment in your career or personal life that you're most proud of? Two years ago, I started this little company with one of my best friends, Jacob Pushkin Audio, Pushkin Industries, as we call it. I think I'm the proudest of that. It's like I've been a, a writer, a solitary person all my life, and now I'm part of this startup, this like community of people. It's super fun. I had no idea it would be that fun. Mind you, Jacob does most of the hard work, so it's doubly fun for me. I get to enjoy, you know, what we've created and not have to do any of the work of creating it. But um, I think I'm proudest of that. That's amazing. Hey, Malcolm, we don't know too much about your personal life, and you can lie, as you said. (laughs) Do you mind my asking, are you in a relationship? I am, yes. Oh, okay, wonderful. Has it been for a while now? Depends on your definition of a while, but a non-insubstantial period of time. Okay, And you can be equally as vague with the question, how did you meet? How did we meet? I think just a kind of standard fix-up. Nothing incredibly elaborate. Well, I like it that you smiled a lot with the thought of this person. At least that's what I'm taking from it. All right. What or who has influenced your career the most? Mm. Early influences, perhaps? I mean, so many... People along the way, like, I always feel like it's unfair to name someone because I feel like it's 50 people. And it also depends on the stage. Like, for example, my neighbor, who's also one of my best friends, who's a screenwriter, Charles Randolph, very successful screenwriter, has had an incredible impact over the last sort of 10 years about how I think about stories and tell them and conduct myself in that realm. But then before that, there was somebody else, you know, and before that, there was somebody else. And going all the way back to my mom. So, you know, it just depends on when you ask. So right now, I would say it's probably Charles. I love that answer. But, you know, it was someone else not that long ago. You ran track in high school? I still run, yes. Will you tell me what your reward in running and and if you have other, what I deem kind of solitary athletic Mm -hmm. activities? Mm -hmm. Do you get that runner's high that people talk about? Yeah, I do. I mean, I never knew exactly what that meant. But I get an enormous amount of satisfaction. It just feels really good. I like the sensation of your body moving like that. You know, the great thing about running when you're in shape is it always feels like you're running fast, even when you're not. I just love that notion of feeling like I'm running fast. I liked it as a kid and I still like it. It's never changed. You know, the New York Times does these short documentary pieces. And I just saw one on um, this man, they call him slow-mo. And he rollerblades for hours in Santa Monica and Venice every day. And he balances himself on his left leg. And then he puts his right leg behind him and he extends his arms. So his head is like the first thing that's sort of cutting through the air. And he's convinced that, and he makes a compelling argument because he sure seems happy. He used to be a doctor and married and he simplified his life. And now he rollerblades. And he believes that it's as close to flying as you can feel because he makes a connection between inner ear trembling and the force of gravity. And it sure seemed convincing to me, the idea that, I don't know, moving through air like that can create a physical sense of euphoria. Yeah. I just need to get out there, Malcolm. Yeah, yeah. I have an exercise. You gotta get you out there. I know. All right. What haven't you taken the time to learn about yet? Yet. You know, languages, I don't know any other languages, which has closed off a whole set of experiences to me that I feel like, you know, I would be a different person if I knew another language or or two. Some people know tons of languages and they have access to things I'll never have access to. What language would you learn? Probably German. Why? I love Germany. I go there all the time. Why do you love Germany? I don't know. I've been going to Berlin for like 15 years, 20 years, and other parts as well. I like... Well, if you like cars, it's a, you know, it's the center of car culture in the world. If you like order and fascinated by history, I mean, it has all kinds of, just as a, you know, an endlessly fascinating, weird, messed up, fabulous place. But I don't speak German, which is crazy. 
Here I love a culture and a country and I don't speak your language. It does feel overwhelming at this point in my life to attempt to learn a language, but that could be an excuse. All right. What was your first boss like? Oh, he was lovely. His name was Vladi. He was a Pole. Vladislav Plezinski. And he was... What did you do? Was this in Canada? No, this was my first job out of college. I mean, I had jobs before that. But my first real boss boss was this guy Vladi. It was my first real job. And he was the editor of a magazine that I was working for. And he was the kindest, sweetest, funniest, gentlest soul. And he was a really wonderful boss. He introduced me to journalism. He had two cats with Polish names. And I don't know, he just was a lovely man. I love how you speak and write about hiring assistants and hiring in general. I'm not quite sure if the conclusion is that it's kind of a gamble. It's a gamble, and we should just accept the fact it's a gamble is my position and stop pretending otherwise. The idea that you can interview someone for an hour and have any meaningful information or insight into whether they'll be good working for you for over the course of many months and years is just ludicrous. <laughs> you might as well just flip a coin. What is your favorite curse word if you have one? Don't have one. Try to never curse. I'm opposed to it. Maybe I should adopt this philosophy. My parents would be happy. Yeah. Just walk away. Yeah. It's not useful. All right. In one word, how would you like to be remembered? Mm, kind, I think. That one works. I agree. But hey, Malcolm, I truly cannot thank you enough. Can you tell us when your book is coming out, your new one? Sometime in the new year. We don't know when I'm having this audiobook come out about Curtis LeMay and Second World War, but it'll be sometime in the spring. Do you enjoy recording? They're tough days, right? Yeah, it's fun though. I don't know. I like the kind of craft of it. It sort of appeals to me. Do you ever think, shit, I shouldn't have written that sentence that way? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, totally. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm... Thank you very, very much for giving my unqualified podcast a degree of legitimacy. Malcolm Gladwell, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, this episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Best Fiends. We all know there really is only one match three style game worth playing. It's the one with an actual storyline, cool collectible characters, and nonstop action-packed adventure. It's the one with literally thousands of challenging puzzles to solve. And yes, I'm using the word literally correctly. Of course, I'm talking about best fiends. You meet your best fiends early in their careers. They don't have much experience, but they have heart. I recognized a little piece of myself in each of them. And so I began to assemble the perfect team. I watched them grow as we solved puzzle after puzzle, working hard and playing hard. Today, my best fiends are ready to go anytime and anywhere. I'm really proud of what they have become. With new challenges and levels added all the time, there's never a boring moment. So download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. I'm happy to welcome Professor Eli Finkel to the show. Eli teaches at Northwestern University and is the author of The All or Nothing Marriage, How the Best Marriages Work. He is also the director of Northwestern's Relationship and Motivation Lab, a contributor to the New York Times and The Economist and has published over 150 scientific papers. I, however, was in the hot chick. <laughs> so... Hey, Eli, thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, all right, so first we are going to call Tiffany. Hello? Tiffany! Hi! I am here with Eli Finkel, and Eli, how would you describe yourself? I'm an academic. I'm a researcher who studies relationships, including marriage. Oh, okay, awesome. <laughs> Tiffany's like, does that mean will I be a part of a study? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, will you please tell us what's going on? Okay, so I have been married for the last four years. And at the end of 2018, my husband told me that he cheated on me several times throughout um, 2018. And so I guess I was shocked, really. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to try to make it work. I'm going to give him another chance and see if we can 
transform our marriage. That I took it as an opportunity to have a new marriage. So um, we saw two separate counselors. The first ones we didn't really like, and so we started seeing another counselor, and he was helping us for about a year. Um, and then he said he no longer could really help us because we weren't making the progress, I guess, needed. Tiffany, you guys got fired by your marriage kids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> he said, <Man. laughs> yeah, he said he couldn't help us anymore. Basically, that just he felt <laughs> wrong to continue to help us and take our money when we weren't making the progress that we needed to make. And I guess the progress that he wanted to see was my husband kind of helping me build that trust again and. um making me feel safe in the relationship. And that just wasn't happening. Um, So we saw him for almost a year. The counselor basically said people can, you know, exit the program like 12 weeks. I mean, everybody's different, but to be in it almost a year and still be at square one wasn't okay. And so after we stopped seeing him, I called a temporary separation because as a final straw, I said, okay, I need to just leave, clear my head and really see if this is what I want to, if I want to spend the rest of my life with him. Um, And so we have been separated the last two months. um, And so he just reached out to me again. We haven't talked the whole separation. Um, My husband reached out to me about two weeks ago um, saying that he was off his ADD medication and he felt like a new man and he wanted another chance. So that's kind of where we're at. He wants another chance, and I don't know. (laughs) I want you to know, though, Tiffany, I so feel this. I so feel when you wrote about your husband being a, a bit depressed and the obligation to make a commitment work, like in terms of our society and our family. But how did you feel just on a gut reaction when he reached out? Was that a relief to you, or was that... Like ego gratifying, like when an ex reaches out and is like, oh, you're the one that got away. Or was it frustrating? Like, can you gauge like your emotional response to that moment? Yeah, I think I was not relieved when I got that text message. And I felt like over the two months of being separated, I really was getting mentally strong and like prepared, honestly, to like file for divorce. And so when he reached out, I was like, wait, like you're putting up kind of a kink in my plans that I was already getting ready to move on and move forward. And then now he's all of a sudden ready to try now. So it, it wasn't relieving. It was kind of frustrating. I was like, I been waiting for two years to hope that this marriage would get better and we could work on it. But now I'm just at the point where I'm like, I don't know. It's, seems like such a long time to go through that and then just say he's now ready. And how have the last two months felt to you? The first couple weeks, I was crying a lot, feeling like, oh, I'm never like going to be happy. Just like a pity kind of, you know, just being really sad. And then after the first like two or three weeks, I started picking myself back up again. And I almost, I felt better because I wasn't stressed with, is he going to love me like I need to be loved? Is he going to be there for me like I need? I was just like, no, he is not here. So I don't have to worry about that. And I was okay. I felt okay. I felt less stressed. So when he did reach out, I was like, I don't want to be let down again. I don't want to go through all these steps all over again. I've already feel strong and like ready to move on. And then he reaches out. And then to me, it's like, okay, it's my marriage. It's like, it's not just a boyfriend. I feel like it's something serious or I can't just like acknowledge that. Eli, tell us about the societal obligation in terms of marriage. (laughs) I've already failed. (laughs) (laughs) You've you've had a couple of training marriages and now you're Uh on your way to great success. (laughs) I believe in love. 
<laughs> perfect, perfect. So, yeah, I mean, if we're talking broadly, um, the, the sorts of obligations that you're talking about, um, we still certainly value them in our society today. Uh, they were much more valued in earlier eras. Um, if you go back to the 1950s or 1800s, the idea of, of marriage as a permanent obligation that was much more sacred back then than it is today. Today we have a, a stronger emphasis not only on living up to those sorts of commitments, but also by and large people today think that people should also be happy. And if the marriage is miserable, how much service are you doing to yourself or to your partner and perhaps even to your children if they exist by staying in a marriage that, that's making you miserable? And by changing these norms or expectations of how we're going to relate in our marriage, we have made marriage a little bit weaker. That is, that you know, relationships that might have been okay in the 1950s strike us as disappointing today. But at the same time, because marriage is indeed more optional and we're less dependent on it, especially women who used to be financially dependent on it in a way that, that is less true today. Those um, were the days. Those, yeah, oh, to be young again, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with, with the freedom, with these changes, comes the opportunity to build a, a deeper sort of connection. Um, the best marriages today are better than the best marriages of earlier eras. And in part, that's because when a marriage isn't very good, we believe that we have opportunities to leave it. Um, I had a, a question or two for you, um, Tiffany, if you don't mind. One of them is, do you have kids in the marriage? No, no kids. Okay, which simplifies things a lot. May I ask you, were you more upset? It sounded like, again, the last two months have been interesting as you've been recuperating. I was interested in honest questions and your responses to them. But I, I'm also interested in understanding which elements were, were so uh, devastating to you. Was it the cheating, the lying, or both? That's so hard. It's Yeah, both to me hold equal value. The cheating and the lying both hurt equally. The reason why I ask is because along with these sort of shifting norms about what marriage is supposed to be, some people are experimenting with this idea of consensual non-monogamy, mm -hmm. but the idea that, that we don't need to have. Some, some people might decide for their own marriage, like, you know, there's lots of things we're asking of each other, but, you know, if there's a little bit of, of romantic non-exclusivity or sexual non-exclusivity, some percentage of people can actually have a, a better relationship that way. So I'm only asking because... If the issue were really the lying, if, if you had said, well, I don't actually care much that he had the affairs, it's really the lying about the affairs, that would have put within reach a possibility that you could have a discussion or an arrangement. My guess from, from your reaction is that does not sound very appealing to you. Is that right? No, yeah. that's correct. No, that, yeah. does, that is not appealing. Tiffany, it wouldn't be to me either. Yeah, not, not your thing, Anna? Not at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I believe it to be, uh, you know, probably a bad choice for the majority of people. It is something that, that can work for some couples. So I was sort of asking the questions that would lead me to think this is definitely something you should keep pursuing. I haven't heard strong answers to that. What would be your best argument for really working on this and trying to make it better other than aren't I obligated? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's what I'm struggling with right now is, am I just staying because I feel like a marriage is serious and I shouldn't just walk away so easy? I don't know. I should fight harder. And then also, does he deserve that chance? He's off his medication that was apparently keeping him from helping me, you know, heal from the infidelity so now that he's off of it, maybe that's something that I'm willing to explore. But I feel the two months I got so strong and I was ready to walk away because I didn't think he was going to come back. He wasn't reaching out to me over the two months and he didn't seem to want to be with me. And so I just got mentally strong. And then now I don't know what to do. Tiffany, I do think that if you're the only fighter in the relationship, that's not only exhausting, but very unrewarding. And I wonder, are there things that you miss about him? In our short conversation, there hasn't been a ton of indication that you've missed him. That means that you're in a really strong place to be independent, if you would care for that. I think the entire like two years after finding out what happened, I really was fighting hard for us to work and I wanted it to work. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the last two months I've missed him, but I haven't missed the hurt and the inconsistency and not making me feel loved. Like I haven't missed that. So 
I am ready, but at the same time, I keep going back to, yeah, is it an obligation? I don't want to, I don't know, I don't want to be divorced and I don't want that on me. I don't know. It sounds bad, but I just don't want that label of like, oh, she's just another, you know, divorced person. And so many people in my family are divorced. You know, (laughs) Tiffany, it's not as bad as it sounds. (laughs) (laughs) So Tiffany, I admire all of those sentiments, and I certainly would not advise you to get divorced, or really, I'm not offering advice either way. One thing that I find really useful when I'm trying to think about whether a, a given relationship is beneficial is the metaphor of thinking about the way Michelangelo, the Renaissance sculptor, thought about the process of creating sculpture. He talked about it not in terms of creating a sculpture, but in terms of revealing it. That is, the beautiful form was sort of slumbering within the rock already, and that the sculptor's job is just to like scrape and buff and chisel until you've really unearthed that beautiful thing that was in there the whole time. You can sort of apply that idea to humans in the sense that all of us have our actual self with all of our flaws and rough edges, and we have our ideal self, something that's, you know, metaphorically inside us, some ideal version. And One of the considerations that we can take into account when we're thinking of what we want to do with our lives is, is this somebody who's helping to sculpt me toward my ideal self? Am I better with this person than I am without this person? Am I better with this person than I likely would be with a different person? These aren't the only considerations and the sorts of obligations you're talking about have real value too. Um, but I do think that that sort of Michelangelo metaphor is, is this somebody who's, who's really helping to bring out the best version of me? Do I love me more because of what this person brings out is at least one of the considerations I'd, I'd keep in mind. Right. That's so good. Eli, I love how you think about marriage as being intimate as opposed to the exterior forces that affect our relationship. And Tiffany's husband like confronting his shame and his cheating and infidelity and Tiffany having to deal with that pain and family knowing about it. And I won't be able to put it as eloquently as you would. But I think you advocate for the idea that marriage is also about personal growth and self-expression. You're right that that I do prize those things, but my my views are a little bit more complex than that because it's also nice to be 80 and have a partner, even though there were a few years in there that weren't very fun. And nobody's going to have a marriage that is always good. You're going to go through periods where you're not thrilled in your marriage. You may well go through periods where you don't even like your partner, and that's in good marriages. And so this is what I think Tiffany's struggling with, and I think with good reason, is, you know, how do you know that things are choppy enough and and choppy enough in a deep enough way that I have to bail, even though, of course, I didn't get married with the intent to divorce? And so the idea that my book is called The All or Nothing Marriage and the idea is that that we've arrived at an era because of this increasing emphasis on making sure that we're in a a marriage that's personally fulfilling and that that allows us to grow into the the sort of ideal version of ourselves, which people just didn't talk that way in the 50s. They weren't even trying. And so that puts a lot of additional expectation on the relationship. And like I said, because of that, marriages that would have been totally adequate in earlier eras are marriages that we're leaving today. It's good and bad because it means that some marriages that are making people unhappy are ending, and on balance, that's a good thing. It also means that the marriages that we really work at and and stay involved with are more voluntary and therefore, on average, better than the marriages of the 1950s. The all-or-nothing marriage is the idea that the best marriages today are better than the best marriages of the 50s, but the average marriage is is worse. And so I have a a, a fairly complex set of views, and that's why I have the sympathy I have for Tiffany, because she's struggling here with – a situation that's making her unhappy, as far as I can understand it, and that as she thinks about the independence that she's able to garner um, when she's separated, she doesn't have to deal with this insecurity and vulnerability and feeling that, is he cheating on me? Is he lying to me? And that that's empowering in a big way. And yet she's made this commitment and she values and respects the institution of marriage or she wouldn't have done it in the first place. So you are you are right, Anna, that I, I very much value that people have this opportunity to really expect real fulfillment from their own marriage, while at the same time acknowledging that the cost of that is that our marriages are indeed more fragile than they used to be. I love that philosophy. I really do. I mean, I am the old school romantic where it feels like your partner should be your best friend and you should have fun and grow together. But Tiffany, that lingering pain And his sort of like a cheap exit strategy or testing those waters of like what, you know, whatever he's going through, like what would my life be like if it went on a different trajectory? To me, it doesn't seem fair to you, 
I don't know if Eli will agree with me. I'm totally going to agree with you. I can't even imagine anything you could say I would disagree with. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so did you respond to him when he recently reached out? Because here's my hunch before you answer this question a little bit, is that I think that even if you say, like, I kind of want to give it some time, I want to think about things, which is rational, I feel like he might pop into your life. I'm imagining him maybe... I don't know, hanging out with uh, his buddies at the bar, like all of my exes did, I guess. (laughs) And like reaching out again, like texting you and you feeling once again that obligation. And if he's like, I miss you and I want to be back together and where did we go wrong? It's more than a little bit selfish of him to reach out, which is why you're like, I don't know how I feel about this. Tiffany, if you want my support, for ending this relationship, you have it. Yeah. But having said that, if you want my support for <laughs> staying in the relationship, you also have it too. <laughs> you know, when people write to us about their partners having cheated or when there's been infidelity, usually there's more emotional attachment towards the person the partner had the affair with. Usually it's like my best friend or somebody in their social group. And the fact that you kind of, in your email, distance yourself from the people your husband uh, cheated on you with, which is probably a childish term, Eli, but maybe that's a whole different subject. I like it. Coming together. (laughs) Tiffany, you don't sound very bitter at all. Yeah, I think because it feels like so much time has passed from when I found out like two years now not that I've forgotten but that's not even what I'm fighting now it's like now I'm fighting the issue of like he doesn't spend time with me he doesn't make me feel important he doesn't make me feel loved it's like I've been battling the cheating like when it happened and then now two years two and a half years later I'm like Now it doesn't even feel like that's my issue anymore. So I guess that's why it feels, I feel disconnected from it because it's like, okay, I I grieved the first year and I was in shock and I went through all the emotions with finding out. And now I feel like, okay, I passed it, but now I'm dealing with how does he make me feel safe and loved and how can I move forward with him if he can't make me feel like the most important person in his life. Tiffany, I'm not sure I care for him. (laughs) I don't. I care for you. And I want you to be happy because I I think that you have been doing all the heavy lifting in this relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Because cheating or infidelity like creates these little scars within us, right? And that they'll always be there when we talk about moving on or even finding closure or like the, the memories you Oh, happiness to yourself and to people that you love. I just don't see the pattern. Like if if you've done all the work in your relationship, maybe he doesn't know how to communicate, whatever that is. I'm not sure. I don't want to totally prejudge him, even though I have Tiffany, I have. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if you're feeling like I've put all of this in to this marriage And I'm not even quite sure who I am anymore or what my goals are or what the next few years look like. But what I do know is that I'm not sure you can convince him to be the husband that you would like in your life. Yeah, I agree. Let me um, just chime in briefly on this. I mean, like I said, I, I don't offer one-to-one advice. I'm a, I'm a basically a social scientist who collects data on aggregate. But I, I will say that if you do decide to, to stick with this relationship, and I, I certainly would respect your choice if you did, you'd better come up with a better narrative for why you're doing it than you've come up with thus far. Oh, Eli, damn, that's harsh. What do you mean? Yeah. I haven't heard a story from from you, Tiffany, about why you want this thing to last. And so if you are going to give it another chance and you haven't yet built a story about what's special about the two of you and why he's a person that you really might want to make your life with again and you really want to work with, I'm skeptical that you can actually make it work. And I don't know that there will be that much value in trying unless, like I said, if you're able to build a more compelling story 
for why that's so important to you, then, you know, by all means. Right. I'm so sorry about the bill. That's dismissal. For oh, my yeah. Students. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Tiffany, are we keeping you too late? I do need to run. Okay, Tiffany, thank you again. We'll be in touch, okay? Thank you, Tiffany, so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Eli, thank you. It's been amazing to talk to you, and I can't thank you enough for joining us. It was so fun. Thank you very much.